Today, in our OBS Studio gentle introduction, let's go over some definitions of things that you may or may not be familiar with when starting this whole OBS Studio adventure. If you like this video, please subscribe and click that little bell for notifications when we release a new video. Welcome to Pull My Focus, Adventures in the World of Digital Filmmaking, where we bring you the inside tips on making great digital video. We started our OBS Studio gentle introduction in a previous episode, so if you haven't watched that, please go and take a look. I noticed when I started working with, especially the TriCaster back in the day and OBS Studio, that there's certain things that may show up in the interface that you might not understand. For general people, some of these terms we just, we need to define so that later on in the series, everyone's pretty much on the same page. Let's talk about your base canvas and your, and your output, okay? So if I come back to settings, there is a tab for video. And one thing you'll notice is it says base canvas resolution and then output scaled resolution. The base canvas is your work area. If you're streaming a game, uh, your base canvas is going to be where, where exactly where your game sits. You need a monster machine to stream at anything higher than this HD. And I don't even think that OBS supports anything higher than streaming at 1920 by 1080. But let's just see how it affects our assets, okay? Um, lower resolution streaming requires less of your CPU and GPU. Okay, so if you find your machine struggling, if you're using X264 and not an external graphics card, and you're trying to stream at 1920 by 1080 at like 60 frames per second, and your machine is struggling, I would suggest moving down to 1280 by 720 and keeping the 60 frames per second and seeing if that works. That's much less required of the machine to push out at a streaming service, all right? If we have our base canvas at 1920 by 1080, which is our work area, Okay, and I switch over to scene one. Oh, that's a beautiful white. <laughs> this little graph here that I stole off the internet is basically telling us this is our 1920 by 1080 area. This area would be HD, right? And this area would be SD here, okay? Um, and this is the area that I have to work in. So this is the area that I can put my game and this and that and whatever. If I switch the base canvas to we go back to video, we say base canvas, 1280 by 720, and I hit OK. That just shrunk. So the only thing I can fit in this window now is this 1280 by 720. There's an assumption that by people who um, go, OK, I'm going to stream, my base canvas is going to be at 1920 by 1080, but I'm going to output it scale down to 1280 by 720. Once again, if your CPU if you're CPU bound, meaning you don't have an external graphics card to deal with this, you're actually scaling, you're actually asking your CPU to do even more work because you're taking every everything in your screen and you're scaling it down, which is another composite. That's making your machine work harder. You don't get that for free. That scaling does not happen for free out of nowhere, okay? So the suggestion always is your base resolution and your output should match. That will take the strain off your machine. Now, if you have like a high-end GeForce card, um, you can probably get away with a high resolution canvas and an output, a scaled down output. You're still compositing once again, so you still may lose quality, okay? So in general, I would say keep the base canvas and the output the same. Scenes and sources. Now, we spoke a little bit about this in the first episode, in the first video, scenes and sources. Right here, I have my scenes list, my list of scenes, okay? Here is my, or my sources that are in that scene. So remember, sources, this is my text, this is a text element I created, this is a color source, okay? And I can lock them so that they can't be moved, all right? Sources, once again, are digital assets that make up a scene. Okay, you have a scene and it has sources in it. So in scene five, these are the two sources that I have contained within. This text element and this color source. Okay, if we move over to scene two, scene two has an HD background, just a background, just an image, that's it. Just a straight up image. 
If I move over to scene five, well, that's where we are on scene six. This has a video running of my buddy, Frank Delario, doing a, a, one of the videos that we did pr previously. All right. And then if we go back to scene two again, there's. So as you can see, scenes contain sources. Pretty simple, right? Let's move on. Transition. What's a transition? Well, it's when a display changes from one scene to another. That's usually referred to as a transition. Our primary transitions are a cut, a dissolve, or what's called a fade, and a wipe. Those are our primary transitions. And guess what? OBS only comes with, out of the box, a cut, a dissolve, and a wipe. Let's take a look at the difference. Okay. First of all, scene transitions, we're gonna be here. This is our general scene transition area. And I wanna say general scene transition area because if there are no other transitions to find anywhere else, this is what the transition, this is what transition will happen. I'm gonna leave it that. It's kind of vague, right? There are times where you can override what this particular transition will do. You can override that. But in general, if I move from Okay, so here, here are some of the things I have. I'm gonna change it to cut. If I move to a cut, then I move from scene two to scene three, it's a cut. And since scene three back to scene two, there's a cut. A cut is an instant change. No softness there. Cool. A fade, or is what we call a dissolve or a fade, also comes with OBS. And here's the fade, and it's set to a duration. I think the default duration is actually 300 milliseconds. And we're we're expressing these in milliseconds so that we have the highest granular, kind of highest accuracy of, of phase and transitions and stuff like that. Generally speaking, you're gonna be talking about a millisecond. A thousand milliseconds is one second. So we're on fade now. If I move from scene two to scene one, it's a fade. And from scene one to scene four, that's a fade. And that's a 300 millisecond fade. Let's say we crank this up to a thousand, which is one second. A one second fade from scene four to scene five is very slow. So that's a fade, that's your second primary. The third primary transition is called a wipe. And OBS Studio has a wipe, uh, the ability to do wipes. If you go to your scene transitions and I'll choose add luma wipe, which is down on the bottom, add luma wipe. Okay, once I hit add Luma wipe, I get to name it. All right, right now I'm just gonna keep it called, it's gonna remain uh, Luma wipe, let's hit okay. Then it brings up a properties window for that wipe. We can have, there are many different types of wipes that are already defined in OBS. It's really super terrific. Um, uh, the default one is linear horizontal, but if I click this, there are many, many, many different types of wipes we can do. Let's just pick one. All right, let's take, let's take uh, something that you really see. Let's do cloud. So if I pick cloud, I can actually hit preview transition and it shows us what that wipe looks like. And these are called luma wipes because they, they are based on the luminosity of the scene. Okay, so if you have a, you can create your own uh, luma wipes also with a black and white image. We'll show you how to do that at some point. So if I hit okay, boop. Now, when I do my Luma wipe, if I go from scene two to scene three, looks like that, scene three to scene six. All right, and I can change my Luma wipe by clicking this little cogwheel here for transition properties. And I can go properties, then I can come back in and change it to something else. So maybe I want a curtain, preview that. That looks nice, hit okay. And once again, the Luma wipe is affected by the duration. So if I set the duration back to 300 milliseconds and do a Luma wipe, very fast. Profile. We talked about this in the first, first episode. There are profiles and there are scene collections, okay? Right now, I am in a scene collection called Definitions Collection. Last time, we just, we, I told you to name your, your scene collection Tutorial. So if you notice, if I switch to Tutorial, look at that. It's back to what we did last time, which was basically nothing. I didn't have anything set in here. But now if I start to create scenes, or if I add, say, uh, a color source, let's just add a color source. 
hit OK, and boom, it's just a white color source, that's it, OK? Now if I go back to definitions collection, boom, it loads in everything from that other collection. So I get to choose which scenes I have loaded between these scene collections. Really important feature in case you want to do multiple, you know, uh, 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 broadcasts. That's where you save it. Profiles, once again, profiles save everything under settings here. So everything that you do under settings gets stored in a profile. And right now I'm still on my tutorial profile because profiles might not change as much as scene collections. Profiles is which, which streaming service you're gonna use, uh, what your output paths are for recording, uh, what your bit rates are. Those all kind of stay the same for the most part, but scene collections do change often. So use those save options. Um, if we come into settings, okay, first thing I wanna talk about is video and audio bit rate. So if we go to output, I'm gonna change this. So this usually says under output and settings, it usually says simple. Um, I'm gonna change it to advanced, okay? So we can look at streaming and recording separately, all right? It's asking you for what the bit rate you want, what is the bit rate of your stream? So bit rate is the number of bits per second, okay? It generally determines the size and quality of the video and the audio files. So generally speaking, the higher the bit rate, the better the quality, but the larger the file sizes, okay? When we're talking recording locally, your, your, your broadcast is going straight to your hard drive. So you can get away with much more bits, much higher bit rates when you're recording locally, okay? You can get up to you know, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40,000 bits per second. When we're talking streaming, that's a different story. And it really depends on the streaming service, your internet connection, the speed of your CPU, so many things. Let's take Twitch, for example. Twitch has a, there's a, there's a list that we can, we'll post in the description of suggested video and audio bit rates for its streaming service, what they can handle, what you can push to them and they can handle. What you can push to them really de depends on your internet so you need to look at how many megabits you can upload. That's all about your upload speed, your up speed, your down speed. You know, some people get um, a gigabit down, but only 40 megabits up like my, like I do. So I can only handle but so much. I'm gonna go basically at one third my upload speed. That's gonna be my maximum upload speed to a service like Twitch. But if you look at their charts, you'll see, generally speaking, you know, anywhere between 3,000 and 6,000 kilobits per second. Uh, look good depending on what you're doing. If you're doing live video, you could get away with probably fewer bits. You could do 3,000. If you're doing high, you know, HD gaming, you might want to crank it up to 5,000, 6,000. The higher the video bit rate, the better quality your stream is going to, to be. Video bit rates and audio bit rates differ in that video requires many more many more. So this, you know, I, I, I usually stream at 4,800 4, to Twitch. Uh, I'm doing mostly live uh, broadcast stuff. I'm not doing too much uh, gaming like, you know, HD gaming or stuff like that. For audio, Twitch now supports 320 bits per second. Notice how much smaller that number is. The audio bit rate, because the audio doesn't require as many bits to render an audio file than it does to render full color HD, whatever, stereo sound. So I generally just crank these up to 320. I think they come defaulted at 160. This is just better quality, you know, better quality audio. And once again, this is all pretty general. So we won't get too specific until we walk into the settings a little bit. Encoder. The encoder is what your computer is using to composite all the stuff. If you think about it, if you're an After Effects person or a Premiere person or whatever, like editor person, you can think of each layer of your timeline as a composite, right? After Effects actually uses the term pre-compose when you want to combine images together into one composition. The program itself has to combine all these assets, all these digital assets, and record them. Well, OBS is doing the same thing, but it's doing it on the fly. 
It really is doing it on the fly. Now, most people, you know, they'll start off, they'll look at their encoder and when they load up OBS, it will say X264. The encoder is very good. X264 is very good, but it relies on your CPU, your central processing unit of your computer. So your CPU needs to be very fast. One rule is if you can use outboard uh, processing for your compositing of OBS, i.e. a graphics card or a graphics chip in your laptop, be, uh, and usually NVIDIA is probably the best deal because of their NVENC technology, you can tell your OBS to use, as you can see here, I have something called NVENC, NVIDIA NVENC 264, that allows the CPU not to have to do any of this compositing. Then the, C then the CPU can worry about, you know, uh, uh, streaming and running your game or just running OBS in general and your operating system. The CPU gets relaxed. The GPU, the graphics processor, takes over all the tasks of compositing. So now your machine will show very little usage on the CPU and the GPU because the GPU is built to do this kind of thing. If you have the option to use NVIDIA NVENC, if you have a GPU that is an NVIDIA card, choose that always. And if you do have just X264, you're gonna want to be very mindful of the CPU, the CPU status at the bottom of the screen, and you're gonna have to be very mindful of how many bits you're pushing out. Basically, the, the system is going to be a little strained under X.264. It's highly suggested you get a, either a laptop with an NVENC uh, uh, capabilities, or if you have a desktop, buy a GPU. Let's talk about recording formats. So when you're locally record, when if you choose to locally record your stream, which you know, generally speaking, you can, um, there are certain formats that are usable. So if we come back here, so we went to advanced, so we can see streaming and recording separate. We're going to go over to recording, okay. There are, so here's your recording path, where it's gonna save on your computer. And here are recording formats. I think OBS comes default set to MP4, which is very familiar to a lot of people, MP4 codec. You can use it. MP4 is prone to uh, corruption if something happens and your stream or your recording somehow gets terminated. Let's say OBS crashes for some reason that MP4 is going to be corrupted and it's very difficult to get that information back if you really need it. I would suggest ignoring all the other ones except for MKV. So if you set your recording format to MKV, then if there's a corruption, you won't lose that file. It's very easy to get the information up to the point where it crashed on an MKV file. Also, MKVs, like MP4s, supports multiple audio tracks. And that's a, a more advanced feature about multiple audio tracks, but suffice to say, MKV has all the goodness of MP4 without potentially losing what you're recording. And if once you're done with the MP, MKV, OBS is cool. It has a great little feature built in called Remux Recordings, which allows you to then load in that MKV and then you can output as an MP4 if you need to. So OBS will handle that for you. So you'll get an MP4 in the end anyway. All right, I think that's enough of definitions right now. We're gonna hit other things as we go through our exploration of OBS Studio. Um, I hope some of this was more clear to you so that if you go off on your own between when these episodes drop, you might have a better idea of what things are rather than just going off into the woods and being kind of, you know, where am I? Once again, I'm going to leave some links in the description for Eposvox channel, as well as the Alpha Gaming channel, which is Harris Heller's channel, which also helps greatly with OBS tips and tricks for hardware and stuff like that. Stick around with me. You know, don't leave me. I'm just trying to help. Where are you going? Where are you going? All right. Anyway, I'll see you guys in the next one.